As a prompt for our conversation on security challenges and containment orders, let's now uh, listen to this background report by Abdul Salam Jubril. <laughs> Matters of safety and security are topical issues of discourse in Nigeria today, and no part of the country seems to be immune from it. Experts maintain that the security challenge has led to the loss of lives and properties, as well as taking a toll on people's livelihoods, businesses, and the country's economy at large. More striking is the recent spate of kidnappings of school children from their schools. Towards mitigating the spate of kidnappings and other security challenges, governors of the affected states that includes Sokoto, Kaduna, Katsina, Zamfara, Niger, Yobe and Adamawa states, among others, have announced security measures that includes shutting down of schools in their states as well as the adoption of the Security Challenge Containment Order. The containment order involves measures to contain banditry in particular and mitigate the damages it is causing to social and economic activities as well as to preserve peace in these states. It includes the immediate closure of some roads to motorists, a ban on lorries or trucks carrying firewood from the bush, a ban on transportation of cattle, a ban on the sale of petrol in jerry cans at filling station, the restriction on the number of passengers conveyed on motorcycles and tricycles, the suspension of the sale of some animals in particular markets, among others. While some experts maintain that these measures are laudable, they are concerned about its effective implementation. They also identified collaboration between residents and law enforcement agencies as vital to the success of the containment order. Thank you very much, Abdul Salam Jibril, for that background. Huh? Now, uh, to discuss this uh, subject matter in further detail, we have uh, with us, uh, two of our regular guests uh, in the Abuja studios here, Group Captain Sadiq Garbashehu uh, is a security and defense consultant and an expert in the Safe School Declaration. Uh, Group Captain uh, Sadiq, delighted to have you again on Good Morning Nigeria. Good morning. Thank you, viewers. Okay. Uh, the other regular, of course, uh, is joining us uh, via Zoom. My colleague Kirian will introduce him presently. But from our Kaduna Network Studios, Brigadier General Mohammed Kabir Galadenchi, a security expert, is joining us this morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Brigadier General uh, Galadenchi. Brigadier General uh, Galadenchi. Nigeria. Thank you. And uh, via Zoom uh, from Kassina, is uh, Ibrahim Ahmed Kassina, Special Advisor to Kassina Governor on Security. Uh, so good morning and welcome to the program. Oh, oh, all right, uh, he will be uh, joining us very shortly. And uh, also via Zoom uh, from Inugu is Dr. Kabir Adamu, a uh, regular uh, guest. He's also a security risk management expert. Dr. Adamu, it's good to have you again join us this morning on Good Morning Nigeria. Thank you, um, Kirian. Good morning. Okay, all right, gentlemen, uh, delighted uh, to have you all with us. Uh, uh, Dr. Kabi Adamu, I mean, the image we saw a while ago uh, tended to portray you as a naval officer. I think you're wearing white or something. And uh, there's no naval base in, in Enugu, by the way, where you are with us uh, this morning. But let, let's start this conversation uh, from uh, Kaduna State, which you know, we can uh, unfortunately refer to as one of the frontline states heavily impacted uh, by the insecurity in different parts of, uh, of, of the Northwest. So we're going to our Kaduna Network Studio, Brigadier General Mohammed Kabir Galadenchi. Uh, who is uh, a security expert. Uh, General Galadenchi. 
when we were kicking off the program this morning, my colleague and I uh, read out the number of measures that have been adopted by uh, most of the states in the northwestern part of the country. And these measures amount to virtually a lockdown as though we were in a state of war. What are your thoughts? Well, um, I think uh, the important thing is that um, there should be policies and uh, programs that government at uh, state and local government levels must take in order to succeed in curtailing this issue of uh, threats. Uh, somehow, this threat started as purely criminal issues. But as at now, what is happening is that these uh, crimes have turned into a social problem in this country, and especially in the North here. Uh, why do I say this? We are having a situation whereby uh, neighbors will connive to kidnap the children of their neighbors. Um, uh, a brother recently, yesterday, I saw a video clip where somebody is being interviewed who uh, facilitated the kidnapping of his sister and uh, whatever. So uh, initially, the those who are in leadership position in, 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 in at the state and local government level, uh, abdicating their responsibility, always complaining about federal government doing not doing this or not doing that or that this and that. But at least thank God that they have started realizing that the responsibility for security squarely lie on them, on them and uh, on uh, the, the policies they bring. And it is only through this kind of policies that you can be able to uh, reduce the impact of this crime for the military or any security agency to be able to deal with the issue uh, uh, or professionally. Because people fail to understand that security operations are just an element of finding solution to a real problem, uh, uh, to uh, uh, security threats of this nature. There are other measures government had to take. And uh, unless this kind of measures are taken, and unless people accept the fact that they want a solution out of this and they accept government uh, sincerity in trying to use these measures to curtail this. I'm telling you, my own thoughts, and I've always been telling people, the way we, uh, the government, suspend Twitter and uh, the uh, the, the, the kind of instigation, the kind of uh, uh, this and that, the mind of people are put in was taken away because there is no uh, this too much uh, selling or whatever of what is happening without really understanding who and who are involved. So with this major that uh, there is no network for them to communicate, we will be able to determine where exactly these people are. Secondly, uh, government usually uh, ask the security agencies, uh, mostly the police and the military, to ensure that they stop this. But one thing I'm always concerned about is that the intelligence agencies are not brought in or are not being challenged to bring in uh, their own expertise, to bring in information, because there will not be boots on the ground, there will not be arms to fight if there is no information for those who are going to operate to be able to operate. 
So I, 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 I think um, the Zambara state government in particular uh, has, uh, and Kasina state government, they have taken the right decisions this time around. And uh, I hope that the citizens of these states, uh, or the front line states, all of them, will accept uh, that it is a necessary uh, uh, evil that we have to go through. I, to me, uh, personally, if the federal government will ask for an advice from me, I will have even asked them, uh, let's try and suspend social media for a, for a whole month. Let's see, because that is a, a one way of uh, stopping people from uh, peddling fake news and news that are not uh, helping the, the, the citizens in being comfortable and uh, composed. Helping the, the, the citizens in being comfortable. All right, sir. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll return to you. Uh, Kingsley is, uh, is, is making a suggestion that uh, uh, there should be a suspension of uh, social media and, uh, uh, what, what, what for one you month. Did, yeah, what you didn't say whether the suspension should be nationwide. Uh, 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 or, exactly. Or and specific uh, locations. That will not really <coughs> go well for general uh, development uh, you know, uh, of, of the country because, of course, even the, even the uh, security agencies also require need their social media to be able to communicate. All right, thank you. Um, let's go to Enugu where we have uh, Dr. Kabir Adam. Dr. Adamu, you, you have done a great deal of research you know, in this direction, and uh, we'd like to hear from you based on the measures now being taken uh, by state governments in the northwest uh, uh, of Nigeria and indeed uh, other parts of, of the north. How will these measures, you know, um, how will the measures assist the security operators and uh, show that uh, uh, the, the, the functionality of uh, these uh, bandits uh, will be curtailed? Will these measures go a long way in ensuring uh, that uh, the operations of uh, these uh, elements uh, uh, can be curtailed. Um, so the objective, the major objective of the measures is to disrupt the supply channels of the bandits um, and also reduce their ability to collect ransom. It, it has been concluded that the major means through which they collect ransom is through phone calls to the fam victims of um, the family victims and the loved ones of the family. So if you take that out, then you would reduce the ability to collect ransom. And in any crime prevention strategy, one of the things you want to do is to reduce the ability of the criminal to enjoy the proceeds of his criminality, in this instance, ransom. So it's a good measure. The other um, objective is to also affect their supply channels, the operational um, supply channels, in this instance, and um, petroleum, uh, where the most governments um, you know, imposed measures on the quantity of uh, foil that you can sell, uh, and then, of course, hoping that it would deny or reduce the ability of these bandits to buy petroleum. And remember, they use motorbikes, and I mean, it, it, the, these motorbikes need petroleum for them to move from one, one point to another. Um, other measures would include, uh, you know, ban on the sale of um, uh, firewood and all that, because of course they use firewood. They are they are in the forest, in the bush, where there is no electricity. So one of the uh, things they depend on is, is firewood, and if you reduce their ability, then of course it will affect con living conditions. Um, then markets that were shut down, most times the cattle they steal, uh, they come to those markets to sell them. So if you close down those markets or regulate the markets, you reduce their ability to sell uh, products in those markets. So all of this would definitely have an effect. There, e there are um, chances implemented fully see a situation where these bandits become resilient. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, Katina State has imposed those measures. Zamfara has imposed those measures. Now, for both states, they share a common border with Niger. And so all of these containment measures that I've mentioned, there is nothing stopping 
these bandits from crossing over to regions and neighboring communities in Nigeria, as an example, and accessing all of these things, including the telecommunications that were. Likewise, the neighboring states, uh, and already we are seeing that happening where they can move out to those neighboring states and access uh, tele telecommunication. So even though I can see the objective uh, from the standpoint of a security practitioner, I also can see the gaps and the likelihood of these uh, criminals also seeing the gaps is extremely high since they are operating in that environment. Uh, the other end of my analysis is um, the front end of intelligence. And I'm very happy the co-discussant in Kaduna brought in intelligence. Um, surveillance, both electronic surveillance and visual surveillance are uh, aspects of intelligence. One of the questions that have I read is or why don't you see through those GSM communications and gather the intelligence that you need for operational purposes. When you ban, you also affect the local citizens. And when you affect the local citizens, it means the possibility of them supporting your containment measures would be reduced tremendously. Um, if instead you sieve through the communications and gather the intelligence that you need for operational purposes, then it means your containment measures will be targeted at only the criminals and not this general uh, containment measure that is affecting everybody in, 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 in that community. Now, the consequence of allowing uh, um, the measures to affect everyone in the community is that, unfortunately, it affects the ecosystem. And when it affects the ecosystem, it allows you know, these, these bad guys to, to recruit from that ecosystem. Um, and perhaps in the course of the conversation, we can expand on, on this level, but it's something that we're monitoring already. Uh, we are aware that there is a massive support for the government measures, but then uh, the possibility of that support waning over time is also extremely high. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kabir Adamu, uh, for your uh, insights. We'll get back to you. Let's come to, to the studios now, where Group Captain Sadi Garbashehu, of course, has been uh, listening uh, to uh, the comments of the other two guests. The uh, guest in, in Casino, of course, we'll, we'll get back to him uh, also uh, later on in, in the conversation. I, 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 I want to just repeat my first question, okay. which is to say, when you take a look at the raft of measures that have been imposed uh, on most of the states in, in, in the Northwest, uh, this creates the impression that you know, this is we're in a state of war. Uh, there's a lockdown. Major highways have been closed in, in Casino. Uh, major markets have been shut. Schools, of, boarding schools have been closed. The academic calendar of, uh, of uh, primary and secondary schools in most parts of the Northwest, uh, that calendar has been disrupted. And so what, what are we getting at? Okay, fine. One way of dealing with, uh, with the bandits and the kidnappers, but uh, the impact on on the larger population, I'm not an economist, but I'm sure that when the numbers do come out, we might see a dip uh, in the GDP from that part uh, of or those parts of, of, of the country. Uh, there is no doubt that these measures, when you look at them individually and collectively, they are based on objective of, secu of improving security and combating these bandits and other criminality in that area. We cannot also you know, be oblivious of the fact that these measures will have some unintended consequences on the communities in that area. Because uh, when you look at the life of the modern man, it relies on all the services that are being blocked. However, this is why the issue of public interest comes into it. Sometimes you have to weigh in public interest versus individual interest versus certain groups' interest, whether economic people in certain economic activities, they will be affected by these measures. So I think uh, while uh, recognizing that the government is acting in public interest, there is also the need for reasonableness and also proportionality. I was following these developments as a matter of uh, you know, uh, professional interest. The first uh, 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 announcement I saw was that communication has been caught. That was the first announcement. 
and uh, I have spoken on many fora that this needs to be time bound. Later, I think a few days later, it was added that it is for two weeks. So it government is listening to uh, this uh, reasonable. Now, looking at the majors themselves individually, there are the ones that even if you are not a, 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 a you don't need to be a security you know expert to understand the, log the logical reasoning behind such reasons. For example, let's start with uh, not buying petrol in uh, filling stations or motorcycles not carrying more than one person. We know generally that the modus operandi, the transportation mode of these one is via motorcycles. So that one is logical. And uh, it's not possible the way they move 100, uh, sometimes 50, 100, uh, you know, uh, 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 motorcycles, that 50 motorcycles will come to a filling station to come and buy petrol. So definitely there are people that buy in Jerica and then take it to the bush, then when they want to go operation, they'll distribute. So those majors are there. But when you look at majors like communications, to my knowledge, both all security agencies in Nigeria, they also use that communication. That one is a double-edged sword. Almost all, 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 all uh, security agencies, they use the same you know, commercial communication means to communicate for their operations. So they too, they will be under some sort of reprieve. The, uh, the general populace, sometimes communications, having communications may be a matter of life and death. You could have a woman that is delivering, you want to call a doctor, you may have accident. So these are some of the issues. So for the communication aspect, it is really a double-edged sword that in as much as it will constrain the bandits from, uh, because I think the reasoning behind that, uh, 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 plus the ones that uh, Dr. Kabir said, is that uh, uh, informants are informing the bandits when uh, military or security movement, they will, ahead of time. There is that. There's also the issue that they use it for, for I mean, to negotiate uh, ransom. But then we also have to look at this aspect of, uh, you know, uh, the effect on uh, things that have to do with life and property, the effects on commerce and the rest. If you look at closing of schools also, closing of schools also, you could say something for it. It is clear that these bandits find schools very attractive. They will go and pick. But at the same time, like Mr. Kioran said, there is the issue of disrupting the school calendar. So it is a balancing act. In the long run, you are looking for something that, uh, you know, that is a balance. What does the average man in Zamfara, what does the average man in Sokoto or Katsina, what, is, what, what, what major would while constraint will serve best his interest? We may not have the best major. We are looking for the least worst major. We are looking for a compromise major. But in accepting these uh, compromises, again, we have to look at the community. What do they want? What is the situation? Sometimes when you take different considerations, okay, when you take school, we need schools. It is in public interest for schools to remain open. It is in public interest to, I mean, for markets to open for economic activity. But it is also in public interest to stop the banditry that is killing people. So it's a weighing equation. And as we go, and some of the issues in my research, like this question of communication, honest, I could not find any example in Nigeria or elsewhere where cutting communication was used you know, as a means of this. But again, that does not stop us from experimenting. In fact, what you find in other terrains is that communications, when you watch uh, one of my favorite channels on, on, on FTU, it's a, it's a crime and investigation. Most crimes is through telephone calls. You need the man to make telephone calls. You identify why he made I know we tried this. I don't know why the NCC project has uh, stopped. Because some making a call, even the bandit making a call to negotiate, if you are well equipped, it is an indicator of where we can get him. You use the mast. You know, every call, we you know, bounces uh, from a mast. You check where the mast, you check the text. And so maybe it is our, you know, low capacity in applying technology. But then something, again, with public interest, sometimes you calculate it ex ante. That is before the fact. We predict some of these measures, like I said, are logical. Some are on tried terrain. Like cutting of communication to help to me as a, as, a, as a researcher, I think it's an on tried terrain. We hope that it will bear, you know, fruit and then we will continue using it, but it is an untreated. I have never read anywhere where this was used as a, because so many things are there. I said, even solving crimes in most countries, what is this telephone calls? It's the calls that the people make. But I know the NCC started a project of registering SIM cards, which will help us to locate. So we have to go back. You know, we have this tendency of starting something and stopping. In Gulf War, yes. in yeah. Gulf War II, uh, when President Bush Jr. Uh, invaded Iraq, um, the alibi of uh, weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. being stored by the Saddam Hussein regime. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the objective subsequently became one of regime change. One of the principal targets 
of the Allied forces led by the U.S. and Britain. What? Telecommunications. Yeah, then they just took it down. Took it down. Then, yeah. And then the broadcast masts were also taken down. Yeah. The only difference with that analogy is that uh, something, again, that America, whenever you're talking about America, America carry out war outside their country. There's no way cutting the communication in Iraq will affect <laughs> the, the, the average American citizen. Mm. But the problem with this one is that we're taking these actions within exactly. our own, our own, our own territory. Exactly. So, yes. and, and, and that's why yeah, I want yeah. to... You know, you know, I know you, you mm. want to ask mm. this question mm. because he raised this point and mm. it's something that we've also touched on on Good Morning Nigeria. When the, the kidnappers are making contacts with members of the family, this is not uh, contact you make interpresenters. It's not physical contact that you and I mm. are seeing. It is through communication. Yeah. People are talking, they are giving directions, and we have always wondered, and I think you've also uh, raised this point on uh, several locations, how come this communication is not being intercepted? Yes, uh, that's a very uh, important question. Why is not uh, intercepted? And uh, as, as, as you yes. get what you just said now, that uh, you know, perhaps because of a low capacity in, uh, you know, applying a technology in, in doing that precision technology yes. so that we can pinpoint and get, look, this is where these people are located. Yes. Right. Okay. Now, let's go to Cassina. Uh, we have finally, um, you know, uh, established a contact with our uh, guest in, in Cassina uh, via Zoom, and that's uh, Ibrahim Ahmed Cassina, a special advisor to Cassina Governor on security. Uh, good morning and welcome to the program. Good morning. Sorry for the network problem we've been facing here. All right. Uh, thank you. And uh, let me also ask you this. Uh, well, Casina is, of course, uh, one of the epicenters. Uh, if, if you ask me, with respect to the issue of uh, kidnapping in, in, in this country, despite all the efforts being made uh, by both federal and the state government uh, to curb that uh, menace. Now, some measures have been taken, you know, by not just Casina, but other state governments in the Northwest area. But let us know what uh, could be the impact of the measures taken by Casina state government and uh, why should the government take such measures? Uh, of course, you are in, in, the, in the terrain and they understand exactly uh, the, the operational uh, methods of uh, these uh, criminals. Why the measures and how far do you think these measures can go in ensuring uh, that we curtail the, 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 the menace uh, by these uh, kidnappers? Well, uh, as uh, explained by the experts there, who have done justice to the uh, topic. The issue is that we made vulnerability assessment to see which are the areas this criminal element are using to deal with us. And that is why we came up with this economic pocket. Because in a warfare like this, there are various strategies to evolve in trying to deal with the enemy. And one of these is the economic blockade. You know, by blocking all supply to them, we are demobilizing them. They cannot move freely as they used to do. And uh, by cutting communication, as earlier explained, they cannot link up with the relations of the victims of their kidnap. So these measures are intended at uh, making them incapable of acting the way they used to do before. And for now, we have started seeing the efficacy of these uh, measures. Because most of their motorcycles that they are using now have been abandoned in the bush, and the ongoing military operation is helping in mopping up this uh, remnant. So, in essence, the reason why these measures are introduced by the state government is to ensure that the means these criminal elements are getting supply of oil, are linking up with people, and uh, even the economic activities like the burning of uh, this uh, truck selling firewood. It's essentially meant to stop people from giving them fuel, because most of these trucks that are taking firewood to the bush are those that smuggle fuel to them, they smuggle arms to them, and the rest. And also, in the areas of uh, our relations with our neighbors, especially the Nigerian public, we're also in contact with them. They're also trying to block their communication access there, because it's something that when you do not network with your neighbor, you hardly succeed. 
And that's why the good development is that the Northwest governors, the Farakasena, Kaduna, Niger, and the rest that came up with these measures, did it deliberately to suffocate the means these bandits are accessing any means of livelihood that is making them viable. So these strategies we have started seeing the positive effect because it's biting harder on them. They are abandoning their motorcycles, they are trying to relocate, and the military operation that is coordinating the area is blocking them from moving out. So if these measures are sustained sooner than we expect, the problem will be over. Because I'm sure had it been we started with these measures earlier, this problem will have not will not have lasted the way it did now. So I'm assuring people the way we have started now, we have started in a good footing, and with the cooperation we are getting from members of the public who have understood that these things are not deliberate. Actually, people are making sacrifices in Katina. They don't care about the suffering they will have now, but they think of the long-term effect, that as long as this problem is over, people will be happier now. So people are making sacrifices to team over the government by giving us even credible information. They don't care that the communication is cut off. They don't care that the full supply is cut off. All they are thinking of is the long-term effect. And they are happy, and uh, they are teaming up with the government. They are praying for our success because they know it's a collective effort. This war cannot be won without collective support from members of the public who have understood because we have explained to them that these measures that are being put in place are not deliberate. They are meant to assist in ending of this problem that has been disturbing us once and for all. Alaji Ibrahim, thank you very much there for your, your explanation and, and the perspective that uh, you have brought in from the casino angle. Of course, it's been embarrassing, the uh, reports of uh, frequent incidents of kidnapping and banditry in most of the local government areas of, of, of that state. But why did it apparently take this long uh, for the state government to kick in with the containment measures that were announced in the executive order signed by the governor some days ago. You know, initially the state governors are operating independently, I can say. There was no proper synergy. But when we realized that nobody can win this war alone, the state governors met, decided to synergize and come up with common strategy. And now it has started paying off. Because initially, you know, the first state started its own program, then for his own, doing his own independently, Kano, uh, Kaduna and the rest. But now, the governors felt that without synergy, these criminal elements are exploiting their differences in security strategy. And as the security experts have said, in security operation, unless you synergize, unless you have partners that will help you to do the needful, so the governors now have realized that it's better late than never. Let them come together and evolve common strategy that will assist them in ending this war so that we have collective peace and security. This problem, these people that are given... Hello? You are on. We can hear you. These people that are... Yeah, we, they are, we are neighbors. If you... Them from Kaduna, they moved to Zamfara. If you block them from Zamfara, they moved to Kaduna. So, but now that we've put in common strategy, common containment measures, definitely uh, it's a good development for us. We have seen the essence of our synergy that uh, once we team up together, we achieve success in a greater uh, form. So, I'm sure uh, it's better late than never. We have realized that, yeah, I did we started earlier, we'll have succeeded better than what we are recording now. But it's not late. We have seen the essence of cooperation. We have seen the essence of teamwork. And I'm sure it will assist us to end this problem once and for all by the special grace of God. All right. Uh, th th thank you indeed. Uh, let's return to uh, Kaduna. We have uh, General Mohamed Kabir uh, Galadanchi. Uh, so you have listened to other guests, you know, make comments with respect to uh, the measures being taken by the state uh, uh, governments. But we also would like to point the fact that uh, these kidnappers are also strategizing uh, whatever measures that have been put in place. They are aware of these measures and they may be also looking for other ways to ensure that uh, these measures do not uh, affect uh, their 
operational methodology. Now, is there any other measure, apart from what has been put in place, uh, to ensure that uh, they are taken care of? Apart from kinetic uh, ap approach to that, do you think that it is necessary to also engage them in a form of a negotiation? That's number one. Number two is, what about the collaborators? Because uh, it has been clear that uh, they don't operate uh, successfully without a collaboration with persons who are also living within the society. Is there any measure towards ensuring uh, that uh, many Nigerians who are collaborating with these elements should stop doing that? Or is there a way to fish them out in the first instance and of course get them uh, prosecuted? Thank you so much uh, for this uh, uh, question. And actually, my real concern about this uh, security threat is that we fail to uh, understand that banditry and kidnapping are one of a kind, and they are being uh, becoming the problem. But there is a social angle to this. This racial angle is that because of the way these things are being uh, publicized, especially on the media, social media, uh, whether they are, uh, uh, they are true news or they are this thing, it affects the psyche of the citizens. One, you find out that, like I said earlier, there are a lot of um, instances of kidnappings, this and that, this and that, they were created based on the information that are being uh, transmitted by different medias to people who have some criminal inclination, but they didn't know how to do it, but because of the way they are doing it. And that is why I said, if you can reduce the, uh, the, the, the communication on the social media. You will reduce the, 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 the pressure on the people on, uh, or, or the, uh, the instigation of the people on how to do this. Is. Secondly, I spoke about intelligence. Like you said, there are people who are collaborators. You can imagine uh, a person has been kidnapped, and then somebody within the same community will stand up and start saying he is going to be the go in between, the negotiator in payment of these monies. And nobody is trying to look at this negotiator. What is the, the relationship between himself and the people who uh, actually did the kidnapping? We have a case of somebody here in Kaduna that was kidnapped and um, uh, he was killed later uh, after the payment of ransom. And some few weeks later, his neighbor uh, started building a house and there were reports and he was arrested. So there are other measures that will be taken in order to uh, isolate these uh, crimes of uh, kidnapping and, uh, and, and banditry from normal social crimes that have been created by this. And the only way you can do this is by really uh, controlling uh, means of communication across the nation so that uh, people are not put under excessive pressure of something that is not directly happening, uh, directly impacting on them, and everybody is there. So right now, I want to suggest that in addition to some of these measures, I think if we enlighten the governments at the lowest level, decides to go on enlightenment uh, to the general public about their own responsibility in terms of security, by providing information, by making sure that the, the citizens within particular uh, environment are aware that uh, they, they should be able
able to report everything that they have seen out of place. Like this issue about carrying uh, firewood, um, charcoal, and most of them. You will see that in local communities, the community, little, uh, community members of the community are there, but these things will be coming into their areas by 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock in the night, which they should take responsibility over it, over and stop them from actually uh, uploading those things unless other people are there to supervise what they are uploading and what are inside those uh, vehicles. So the, 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 the issue is that we must differentiate between uh, the crimes that are now being uh, social crimes or crimes that are socially being created because of the backlash of the kind of information that is being transmitted to the, 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 uh, to the citizens. Whereas in most countries, there are so many, so many things that criminally uh, they, 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 they are committed, but the media is responsible enough to know what to report and what not to report. In our own climb uh, with the social media, uh, people will be uh, reporting details. Even the police, the last time we spoke with some of them, I told them that some of this, when you come out to explain or to, to, to publicize what you have achieved, you don't have to be showing how guns are being stuck inside vehicles or how a crime was committed because somebody is there, is ready to uh, learn something out of what you are doing and try it somewhere. So I, I think I think the the, the measures uh, as at now for government they are enough, but we need to also look at as at now. Uh, all right, uh, Brigadier General Galadenti, thank you very much there for uh, your your perspective. Let's return to Dr. Kabira Adamo. Uh, still with us uh, via Zoom uh, from uh, Enugu. Uh, uh, Dr. Kabir, I I'm just wondering, you, you know, I know that you had raised some points earlier which you may wish to expatiate on, but uh, listening to the uh, Special Advisor on Security to the Casino State Governor uh, and what he says is uh, the popular support that uh, the measures uh, are receiving uh, in that state. What do we know about, say, the rest of the Northwest? I, I keep using the war analogy. Uh, I know that, I mean, the Civil War was an ugly thing for us from 1967 to 1970. But I'm just concerned also about the kind of, if you like, virtual war messaging that the uh, electronic media are dishing out at this time in those states that are heavily impacted uh, by banditry and where these measures have now been uh, enacted and where also uh, security measures, you know, are mopping up, seeking to neutralize these persons. What, what do you know uh, about the kind of messaging? Are the people being mobilized uh, to back, you know, the security agencies? Are they being mobilized uh, to be, you know, useful? Uh, agents, if you like, for the intelligence services. And if any of that is not happening, what would you like to see? Um, thank you for this very beautiful question, um, uh, Honorable Kingsley. Um, it's been done, but I am of the opinion that more effort is required in advocacy, in sensitization, and in strategic communication. Uh, in particular, I would like to emphasize the role of the state assemblies. Um, I don't want to go into the legality of the containment measures uh, because most of them were part, uh, passed by executive fiat uh, from the governors. Now, in a democratic setting, you would want to think the state assemblies should play a role in this regard, especially in this uh, effort towards advocacy, towards sensitization, and towards putting in pl place palliative measures to reduce the effect and consequences 
on the people. So in that regard, I'm hoping to see um, improved effort by all the state governments um, in uh, making sure that the state assemblies, there are various ministries of information and where they have uh, um, components of the national orientation agency, that uh, they would go out there, engage in advocacy, engage in sensitization. And I must commend NTA for providing this platform because I'm sure a lot of uh, residents in those locations would be able to see this and understand um, what is happening from an, a non-partisan point of view. Everybody gathered here to an extent is non-partisan. So our views most likely would reach them in a manner that they would understand and appreciate. Now to that extent, um, what is the consequence of public support to an operation like this? Frankly, it will be the decider with, with, between whether the operation will be successful or it will not be successful. Uh, there are not, not enough boots on ground to ensure an enforcement of these measures. I th that's something that all of us, I think, here would agree. We do not have enough military or security personnel to enforce this. So the only way to get it uh, successful is to ensure that the people themselves own the measures. In other words, they support government in implementing the measures. And how can they do that since they are not armed? Is by sharing information. And um, the barometers that my consultancy is using, uh, which is Beacon Consulting, we do what we call atmospherics um, whenever these types of things are happening. And I can tell you, as at yesterday, the barometer in indicated almost 80% support at um, the state level for the measures. In other words, the generality of the citizens in Kasena, Zamfara, Sokoto, and to an extent, Kaduna are extremely supportive. 80% were supportive of the measures. But my point, and I want to emphasize this, is these palliative measures, the advocacy and the sensitization we, we have advocated is not done, then that 80% can change. Uh, mainly because, uh, I mean, a hungry person can easily be influenced. And right now, those measures are affecting the ability of people to feed themselves and remember, the bad guys are also there. And when I say bad guys, I'm not just talking of the criminals or the bandits. I'm talking of uh, political elements that unfortunately would not want this measure to succeed. We have to admit that there are certain political elements that would take advantage of this opportunity and seek to thwart the success of it. So what can they do? They can also put in place incentives to dissuade people from actually supporting it. So, and that is why it's absolutely important that the whole of government, the executive arm, the legislative arm, and to an extent the judiciary should engage in this advocacy, this sensitization, and put in place palliative measures for law-abiding citizens, law-abiding citizens, so that the impact is not hugely felt by those law-abiding abiding citizens. Sometimes, like a father who has to choose between feeding his, his family and unfortunately breaking the law, that's the worst thing you want to put any citizen uh, to, where he has to make that choice. And I am saying that if we allow these measures to go uh, for a long period without putting those palliative measures, then sometimes parents will have to make that choice. And we all know where they are likely to, to tilt to. No, all right, uh, gentlemen. You know, these measures have just been uh, enunciated, and uh, we're also going to be hoping that uh, its implementation will go a long way in achieving uh, the impact that it was uh, designed for. Uh, well, again, you know, sustenance of such measures is also part of what we'll be discussing. Uh, we'll All right, uh, thank you for staying with us on Good Morning Nigeria up to this moment. Uh, let's uh, return to Captain Sadiq Garba Shehu, uh, Group Captain Sadiq Garba Shehu, on this issue of uh, sustainability of the measures put in place. Uh, my colleague has uh, highlighted earlier on the fact that uh, many schools have been short. Of course, you know what that has done to the school calendar. We talked about the shutting down some markets and all of that. Some people rely on those markets for their, for their, for their livelihood and all of that. So there are negative impacts with respect to the society. Now, sustainability of these measures, how far can it go? Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kieran. Yes, uh, even in my first intervention, I spoke of unintended consequences. We cannot be blind. There are definitely unintended consequences of these measures. And how do we mitigate them? We agree it is in, uh, in public interest that these measures are taken. Dr. Kabir has spoken of uh, 
formula they used to arrive that 80 percent as we're talking now 80 percent of the population in this area are in support of these measures but this support will be waning as time goes on because people will be feeling it so what i would advise government to do first is to periodically be reviewing these tactics periodically be reviewing them to see what needs to be changed what is not to be changed. and again uh, it is my opinion that uh, not enough advocacy has been done with the people when these measures were there is need to inform the people that the government we may take this one for granted that people know but it's not everyone that will know we know these measures are going to cause hardships but please we are calling on people's understanding that these measures are necessary you periodically review them you also i want the security agencies like i said some of these measures this is the first time we are trying them in nigeria this is the first time we are trying them lessons learned should be documented so that when we have such a crisis next time we'll know what worked what didn't work definitely we must be realistic it's not everything that will work out of these measures some will work some will not another thing i would like to add there are additional measures because uh, mr kieron you spoke as uh, as the military or security strategizing the bandits are also strategizing drawing from my experience during the uh, fuel crisis where i headed uh, a fuel intervention measure in kano we want to stop them from buying uh, fuel in uh, Jerican, which is good because they are motorcycles only Jerican, but there are other measures that the security agency should look at for. One motorcycle buy multiple times from a filling station, or one vehicle returning multiple times to buy fuel in the filling station. Vehicles having extra tanks below them, it, a, a vehicle will be taking fuel for about uh, 20,000 uh, you know, uh, Naira, there's something wrong. So we have to find a way Either by introducing, in, in war situation time, people introduce ration cards. Every vehicle should have a ration card. I mean, a ration, what are you going to buy? Any filling station you go, you must show that to know when last did you take fuel. These are extraordinary measures, but you look at them. Another important major, motorcycle, motorcycle, motorcycles. We should take registration of motorcycles as serious as we take the, 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 the registration of motor cars in this environment. Motorcycles, between people selling motorcycles, dealers of motorcycles, there should be a requirement for anybody purchasing a motorcycle before the final release, he properly identifies himself with address, name number, and what everything. We should take that very serious. Um, uh, I would also like to say that uh, we should interrogate ourselves. One of the reasons for cutting communication is that bandits get informants. We should interrogate this government's governance elements there. How is it that bandits can get informants, but our security forces cannot get informants? It is, it is a question. How is it that, uh, the, the, I mean, the informants have more affinity with bandits than they do with our security forces? Here again, our intelligence agencies, I would like to call them back to go back to what I would call old school intelligence. While I was growing up in any major hotel, in any major motor park, in any major Ashawa house, sorry to use that word, in the public TV, they have, they have intelligence people that are there. They stay and mask with the people. We should go to this. There's no, sometimes there's nothing that beats human intelligence. You need to have people. These markets were closing. The security agencies have enough resources to plant people in those markets. You could plant a cattle dealer in that, in that, in that market. You could plant all sorts of people. It takes some money, but it takes some innovation. We should go back to this uh, old school intelligence uh, methods. Again, I've spoken about uh, more communication with the populace because definitely, like we said, the populace to support these measures is very necessary. 80%, as Dr. Kabir said, is very good. But the longer you go with these measures, the more people will start complaining. And naturally, Nigerians are not even the most uh, patient uh, of people. So I want, uh, you know, these are the things that uh, I, will, uh, I, would, I would like to say. And uh, palliative measures, palliative measures. Now, I gave the impression that, uh, I gave the, the, the example that if somebody has somebody who is seriously sick, a woman that wants to give birth, if somebody has an accident, normally it's telephone he will use. He doesn't have that telephone. So how do you solve those cases? I would like to see more patrols within the towns so that you find people distressed. Uh, if possible, if the government can, can, can hack it, have more ambulances going around so that people that have distressed cases, you can contact them and give them support because now their means of communication with these essential services has been cut off. These are some of the issues I just want to add. Group Captain uh, Shadik, thank you very much for uh, the additional suggestions you have made, uh, of course, along with uh, the other guests. Uh, one particular one of interest is uh, registration of uh, motorcycles. I wouldn't know whether my colleague Kilian and I were on set. Yeah, we uh, with, that. We, on Good Morning Nigeria, it was a full topic. The president of Okada Riders Association was our guest. He was seated on the opposite chair here. 
uh, the VIO uh, uh, director was with us uh, and several other guests. Uh, and the issue was discussed extensively. But even here in Abuja, that's uh, the capital city, you go to some locations and you see motorbikes that have no registration, number plates. No number plates. They are all riding and then picking up. So that you can use it to commit any crime, any crime abandon, the, abandon the bike and go away. Mm. And so and we have had instances with the mass abductions uh, in recent times where the kidnappers have been so audacious as to be requesting for new motorbikes as part of the ransom exactly. to be paid. Exactly. Okay, gentlemen, let, let's uh, try and link up again with Alaji Ibrahim uh, in Katsina. Special Advisor to the Casino State Governor on Security. Uh, Alad Ibrahim, I, 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 uh, I'm wondering if you heard the suggestions made by the other guests. Uh, one or two of them I would like you to speak to uh, right now. Namely, what is the nature and intensity of advocacy uh, using the public media, that mostly radio, uh, and if you like television, uh, in your state, for instance, to get the war messaging to your people, to say galvanize them, to ensure that the support that these measures have elicited, that that support level doesn't win. That is one. There's also been the, the suggestion by group captain Sadiq that, okay, where you have a blockade of this nature, imposed, of course, for good cause, uh, then there, are, there ought to be official uh, responses by way of increased patrols, the deployment of ambulances and all that, and more importantly, as Kabiru mentioned, palliative measures. If persons now are having their economic, likes to say law-abiding citizens, are having their means of livelihood disrupted, how do they supplement their living? Well, actually, uh, it's an excellent suggestion. There's nothing you can do without proper public advocacy and public perception management. In Katsina, what we have done, we are in liaison with traditional rulers, community leaders, and all there, to sensitize members of the public to realize these measures we are taking are in their best interest, and if they cooperate with us, the end result would be. Well, we are oh, shame, beginning right? to yeah. have, uh, yes, you know, the, uh, glitches there in, um, in, the, in the network that uh, has already established uh, uh, Ibrahim uh, for this uh, conversation. But we hope that uh, it will get better so that we will return to him because uh, Kinsley just put a very important question to him so that we can get some clarifications with respect to uh, what's happening in Katsina. All right, uh, he's back. Let's hear more from him. So you see, the issue of advocacy is very important. All right. All right. Uh, it, it has persisted. Uh, we're still believing that uh, something will be done to reestablish him one more time uh, for that important question to be answered. Because Katsina, of course, is there. Uh, one of the epicenters of this uh, kidnapping right, in Nigeria. Almost uh, every, other, every other day we hear about the kidnapping in, in Katsina. Um, let's get uh, Dr. Kabiru uh, Ademu once more. Dr. Kabiru Ademu, what I want to ask you now has to do with the issue of uh, uh, if success is recorded based on the measures now being put in place by these uh, uh, number of uh, state governments. Assuming we begin to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, kidnappers, or rather uh, uh, bandits uh, surrendering to, to, to governments. You know, these are Nigerians and they're in their thousands. You know, should there be any kind of uh, also a measure uh, to contain them in terms of uh, skill acquisition? Because some of them don't have any skill. Some of them, as we hear, um, have been cattle uh, rearers for, uh, you know, uh, for, for a number of time who abandoned that business and, uh, of course, they took up uh, banditry as a way of life. Uh, if in the long run uh, these measures begin to yield fruits and they begin to surrender uh, and what have you, what would government do, you know, to uh, ensure that those people are, uh, are, are taken care of? If you, you like, you use your, I use your word, the palliative measures or other measures that could be used to say, okay, fine, you have abandoned this job, okay, now this is what we're going to engage you with to see whether you can become a better Nigerian. 
Um, thank you, Akira, and beautiful question. Um, I have in the past advocated that we should uh, come up with a framework and um, this recommendation was specifically uh, made to the Office of the National Security Advisor, a framework that will guide um, these states where banditry is endemic or um, post banditry. In other words, what do they do with the victims themselves? What do they do with the perpetrators? Now, in my opinion, and lawyers can correct me in this regard, I do not think the state government governors have the powers to grant amnesty to the nature of criminality that the bandit commits. Um, we're talking of rape. We're talk in fact, in some instances, these are war crimes. Uh, bandits can be charged with that. They go into villages, they pillage villages. So it has to be a federal decision. And I am I'm, I'm of the opinion that the federal government should pre provide the framework. Now, in doing this, I have also advocated that we should separate three groups. We should disaggregate the the, the threat, uh, the criminality. Um, farmer had a violence, militias that are associated with farmer had a violence. Then uh, gunmen that commit acts like kidnap for ransom and other criminality that we all detest. And then lastly, um, the political, what I would call political bandits, who are being used, unfortunately, by fifth column units within the society to achieve objectives. Now, the first category, as far as I'm concerned, which grants some level of support for reintegration and post banditry. The other two categories, I'm of the opinion that we should use the full wrath of the law to prosecute them for the offenses they have committed for a lot of reasons. Number one, to serve as deterrence for others who may want to follow that path. Number two, to ensure that we maintain a society where um, the semblance of law and order, where we every decides to you know, use the gun, we now talk about granting, it will not all go well for the future of, of this country. So I am of the opinion that we should disaggregate the challenges and approach it in, in that manner. Now, having said that, if, we, if the government comes up with a framework for addressing this challenge, you know, unitedly by all the states involved, what would happen in terms of uh, rehabilitating or prosecuting the, 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 the bandits that, or whatever, whatever country that the persons that decide to give up on this would happen? Um, the truth of it is the three components of government would have to play a role, the executive arm, the legislative arm, and the, the, the judiciary in terms of agreeing at, at state level now. Remember, the federal government has decided on the framework. At the state level, they would have to decide whether to implement that framework fully or perhaps to variate it to meet their own local requirements. Um, in summary, I am of the opinion that, yes, there may be a need, but not for all of the um, perpetrators of this act. We need to separate between the hardened criminals, those who have, who have committed offenses that are of a federal nature, and those who have even violated international um, law, criminal laws, as it were. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kamira, thank you very much there for uh, your, your perspective. The legal issues you have raised uh, are quite germane. There's no, no question about that. Uh, but simplicity, I mean, rape uh, and kidnapping, uh, that's to say, it's just rape and kidnapping on their own, these are state offenses. But the nature of, of banditry and kidnapping and allied offenses that uh, we have seen in recent times, the nature would uh, tend uh, to amount to levying war against Nigeria, against, against the Federation. It would also uh, tend towards acts of terrorism. At least, you know, there, there were reports of, uh, of a jet of the Nigerian Air Force being shot down uh, by one of these bandit elements. So those obviously, I mean, in drafting the charges, that uh, would imagine, uh, I would imagine will be uh, a, a federal offense. And therefore, uh, a state government cannot purport to then grant amnesty. That's by way of prerogative of, of, of mercy. But again, we're just talking about the containment measures dealing with all of this person. I want to come back to uh, group Captain Sadiq. Group Captain Sadiq, we are the home stretch for this. Yes. I know, so you, you, will, uh, you will have to condense you know, your, your response. Uh, one point that I want to ask is as follows, and I had cause to raise it here when we're doing our municipal review. Yes, all of these 
uh, efforts have all been thrown in now to get things, you know, uh, under control. But I've raised the issue of responsibility and accountability. I want to link that to the intelligence gathering, the, you know, the old style uh, intelligence gathering. If mass abduction happens in my jurisdiction, I should, I should, I should take responsibility in the first instance. I should be held accountable. So in a state where there has been mass abduction, you would expect the head of the police in that state to take responsibility. You would expect the uh, AIJ in charge of that zone to take responsibility. You would expect the director of the DSS to take responsibility. You have a brigade, a big brigade, or if there's an Air Force uh, command, they, they have their own intelligence units. I, I'm not saying that each of them, you know, you put them in the dock, but they must take responsibility for what has happened in cases of mass abduction, which means that there had been a failure somewhere. Why did that failure occur? And how can you stop such failures in future? Because it is so easy to say, ah, you know, it's kidnappers, or oh, it's bandits, and therefore, you know, you push responsibility uh, to virtually to nobody. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this issue you raised, uh, I think it has bearing with all domestic operations that are carried out. And what is the chain of command whenever something is happening in any part of the country? Right from our constitution to all the, whether you said uh, national uh, defense policy, national security policy, there are still some gray areas. In fact, uh, related to this, you could see what happened during the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the infamous, let me say infamous, NSAS project. There was a, you know, lack of clarity from whom does the commander on the ground take care of this thing. Without taking all back, you know what happened. The, the Lagos State government initially said they had no hand in bringing military here. I am one of the advocates that stand that as of now there is no clarity on what happens to the local police commander, the local military commander, from whom does he take order to act. We have to look seriously at that aspect. There is confusion. And when you leave work to nobody, you know, First of all, there's jeopardy for the, for the local commander. Like what happened in Lagos, if the local commander acts on anything, and the governor, who is supposed to be the political head of that unit, says, I did not send you, you are in trouble. You have a problem. So we have to clear that. Permit me also to raise the issue of amnesty or non-amnesty. Uh, this issue is very important because people, Nigerians, we like just drawing equivalence. Amnesty was given in Niger Delta, so give amnesty to bandits. Amnesty is being considered uh, for Boko Haram surrenders, give amnesty. What people, most people, and here I'm intervening as an expert of uh, law of armed conflict. These are two situations. The law makes clear distinctions between security issues. There is one that has raised to the level of war or armed conflict. There is one that is at the level of criminality. In the level of criminality like this banditry, it is level of criminality and it is domestic law completely that should regulate that. There are states that have passed uh, even death sentence, I think, for kidnappers. Mm -hmm. If there's a kidnapper there, it is my opinion, the state should just use that. But when you talk to armed conflict, it is being regulated by an international, you know, international law, non-international accord like we're having. So it's non-international armed conflict that talks about amnesty. Even then, amnesty for certain group of Boko Harams or whatever insurgency you're talking about. As far as criminals are concerned, as far as criminals are concerned, domestic laws should be applied and should, they should face the full right of the law. I would not support the idea of talking for amnesty for, 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 for bandits. Well, there, is no, uh, there is no basis for that. Let's uh, leave it at that. I, I think we should uh, you know, uh, have uh, another round of this uh, conversation you know, for us to touch on a number of uh, issues that have arisen you know, based on this uh, discussion today. Uh, now you're beginning an issue of uh, criminals and terrorists and, and what have you. But to put together, a layman could say, look, they're all criminals. Exactly, you know, those people are saying. They abduct, they kidnap, they kill, and, and, and what have you. But that's you. not the view of the law. Well, well, fine. Yes. Well, <laughs> we, made, we made the law. Yeah. All right. Mm. Okay, um, we have come to the end of this uh, edition of uh, Good Morning Nigeria, and I would like to uh, thank all our guests for being here this morning. Group Captain Sadiq Garabashehu, uh, security defense consultant and expert in the school, uh, safe school declaration. Uh, we thank you for coming. And uh, from Kaduna, we had uh, Brigadier General Mohammed Kabil Galadanchi. So we appreciate you for being part of our program this morning. And uh, also, we had uh, Ibrahim Ahmed Kassina uh, from Kassina via Zoom, special advisor to Kassina Governor on 
security. We, we, we thank you uh, for your insights. Of course, uh, time didn't allow us to get more uh, from you uh, as it were. Also, via Zoom, we had uh, Dr. Kabir Adamu, a security risk man uh, management expert who reached us all the way from Enugu, uh, the Coast City. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being part of our show this morning. All right, now this is Good Morning Nigeria, and uh, we are, of course, uh, uh, winding up the program. And